Hello, everyone. I would like to introduce Maggie Chen. Maggie is a PhD student in computer science at Stanford, advised by Professor Christopher Ray, focusing on theoretical machine learning. Uh, she has published several papers on the theory behind speed supervision at top venues like ICML and iStats. Uh, more broadly, she is interested in developing theoretical frameworks for incorporating diverse sources of knowledge into machine learning models and evaluating them geometrically. Uh, she previously graduated summa cum laude from Princeton, Princeton University in operations research and financial engineering, where she received the Ahmed S. Kasmat Prize for outstanding thesis research. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming me. All right, thank you for having me. Um, I'm super excited today to share some of my work um, at the intersection of uh, weak supervision and these large pre-trained models. So hi everyone, my name is Mei and um, today I'm gonna share some recent work um, I've been doing and I think it will be of interest to a lot of people in the audience today. And I also like to thank uh, Snorkel and Roberto for making this ML whiteboard talk possible. So to motivate our work, let's look at a traditional machine learning setup. And so we assume that um, in a supervised learning setting, we typically have a large labeled data set, and then we train a deep neural network from scratch on it. And so uh, the question is, what is the problem with both of these steps? Um, in practice, acquiring labeled data can be very time consuming and expensive, and training a deep neural network from scratch is also pretty costly. And this makes machine learning less accessible to practitioners who want to use it day to day. So if we start with an unlabeled data set, um, it takes a long time to label. You might need to hire people to label it. And um, you also might even need very specialized domain expertise to um, properly generate, generate uh, highly accurate hand labels. And so this overall will slow down the process. And um, on the model side, if you want a model that performs sufficiently well, you will need, um, you'll need to train for a long time and you'll need um, access to oftentimes a lot of compute resources. So the question here is um, how do we make machine learning more accessible to practitioners by kind of relaxing these requirements on both the data side and on the model side? And so on the left-hand side, let's suppose we start with an unlabeled data set. And so we can do he things here like um, active learning or semi-supervised learning, like few shot learning, where um, we just ask that um, the user inputs a few uh, labeled samples and then the algorithm kind of takes care of the rest. Um, another angle on this is to take advantage of the fact that there are a lot of noisier sources of supervision um, that are just lying around for cheap. And um, we can get things like crowd workers, um, user specified heuristics, knowledge bases, and things like that. Um, and so that's exactly where snorkel comes into play and weak supervision. And um, this is to figure out how to programmatically label these data sets using noisy sources. Now on the model training end, we've also recently seen the rise of these large pre-trained models such as BERT and um, OpenIS GPT-3, CLIP, and just this week, DALI-2. And these models are basically trained on very diverse corpuses of data and are known to generalize well. And the nature of machine learning now is that uh, as a practitioner, I can just grab one off the shelf at um, like a hug, hub like hugging face and then just use them for my own task. So now it's a lot more simple to get these um, very performant models. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to refer to these models as uh, foundation models or FMs. And um, so when we look at this picture overall, uh, weak supervision has helped make data set creation a lot easier because it injects this highly specialized signal so that um, you can label for your particular task. And on the other hand, foundation models offer very good generalization. And then we can kind of see them as offering very general purpose information. So it makes sense that these complementary signals can be jointly exploited. So the natural question to ask is just how do we combine weak supervision with these foundation models? 
And the rest of my talk is as follows. So I'll first provide some background on weak supervision and foundation models. Then I'll go into a bit of the technical details of weak supervision and discuss our method LIGER, which uses foundation models to address two key challenges in weak supervision. Then I'll briefly discuss the theoretical properties of foundation model embeddings that allow for our method to work, as well as our empirical results and conclude with summary and future directions. So I'll first describe how the weak supervision pipeline works. So we always start with this unlabeled data set with unknown labels that we assume to here be binary. So just plus or minus one. And the example here I have is the spam YouTube data set, which is just a bunch of YouTube comments on some music videos that are either uh, spam or not. So in weak supervision, users will write uh, programmatic labeling functions such as the ones here. So I'm gonna refer to them interchangeably as uh, weak sources and labeling functions, but uh, you can see how they're noisy heuristics. Um, for instance, if a comment has check out, there's a good chance it's spam. And another, another way to think of them is kind of like uh, votes on the true label of a given point. So with just these labeling functions, we learn a model over them and the true latent label. I'll go into a bit more detail about this method later technically, as broadly known as latent variable estimation. But here we're basically constructing a graph depicting the relationship between the labeling functions and the true label. And we learn these uh, theta parameters here, which you can kind of imagine are these scalar weight parameters corresponding to how accurate a labeling function is and how much you want to um, consider or value its vote. And then finally, we use this learned model to output probabilistic labels. So it outputs a score here between negative one and one, and we just threshold them to get automatic labels on our data set. And so for this work, we're mainly just going to focus on evaluating the quality of the weak supervision pipeline from the unlabeled data set step to the probabilistic label step. But typically what we do is like after you get this, um, after you get the labels, you just construct your weekly labeled data set and you can train your downstream machine learning model or um, just do whatever you want to do with them. Now let's turn to the foundation models. So as I mentioned before, they are pre-trained on a lot of data and they're known to generalize well to many tasks as shown in this uh, diagram here. And so to use one like BERT, what you do is you just, you know, you import it into your code via PyTorch or something like that. And then you fine tune the model on your target task. Um, however, even fine tuning is technically just full training. And so this can be a bit time consuming and expensive. And um, if we think practically, we don't want to continuously retrain models, um, especially after you deploy it. You just want something very simple. And uh, furthermore, for a lot of these other foundation models, uh, access to them is a bit limited. So model weights are not typically accessible. And uh, we only really have access to the embeddings of these models via some uh, API. So um, a reasonable problem setting here is to assume that we're not actually going to be touching the model weights and instead we um, access the foundation model via its embeddings. So here I'm, I've written out this kind of formalism of uh, we're just accessing the foundation model via this f of x where f is just a mapping into the, from the input space into the embedding space. Um, so now that we've established what weak supervision and foundation models are, um, there are some simple ways to use both of them together. And so let's say we run weak supervision on our unlabeled data set, and now we have a weakly labeled data set. And so then we imagine we can just um, sequentially apply the, the information from foundation models. So as I mentioned before, we are unable to do full fine tuning of the foundation model, but there are other alternatives. So for instance, we can just do k-nearest neighbors in the embedding space. So when we see a new point, our model just gives it the weak label of the point nearest to it in embedding space. And um, we can also fit simple models on top of the embeddings, such as linear probes um, or adapters, which are just simple uh, multi-layer perceptrons that take in input f of x. 
But uh, it seems like we ought to be able to do better than just the sequential application of these two concepts. And so what we want to know is, is there actually, is there a way to use the information from these foundation model embeddings to improve weak supervision in a principled way? So maybe a way to incorporate foundation models into the weak supervision setting is by identifying current challenges in weak supervision. And so here I'll give a high level of them. And then when I go into technical detail later, I'll explain them in more depth. Uh, so let's look at this uh, little abstraction of our unlabeled data set we have before. And so um, we apply the three labeling functions from the previous spam YouTube example to this data where the coloring basically shows um, the data points that each labeling function is applicable on. So in the current week supervision setup, I mentioned we learn a model with parameters describing the accuracy of a labeling function, but we basically just learn one set of parameters over the entire data set. So it's basically one uh, scalar value associated with each labeling function. And this basically assumes that the errors that labeling functions make are completely uniform over the entire data set. But um, we can be a bit more fine grained and precise here to match more subtleties in the data set. Now for the second challenge, um, notice that there's that one white uh, data point that none of the three labeling functions cover. And for points like these, we say that the labeling function um, abstains on them and has low coverage because the text in this comment here, like none of the keywords like check out, love, subscribe are in the comment. So we, we don't really have any information from the labeling functions on it. And so as a result, when we give the weak supervision model this point, we don't have votes from the weak sources. And so the model will be pretty uncertain on this data point, And we are more likely to output a wrong label for it. So um, to better understand these challenges, we're going to dive a little bit into the details of the weak supervision model. And um, so we can also understand where the foundation model embeddings can help. So um, let's formalize this setup. We have our three ingredients I've mentioned before. So we have this unlabeled data set and we have a bunch of these labeling functions that can either vote positive one or negative one, so spam or not, or they can abstain with this placeholder vote of zero. Uh, then we have the foundation model embeddings, which we model as a fixed mapping from this input data to a high dimensional embedding space. For the output, uh, formally the output of the algorithm is going to be a probability that our true label is one. And uh, given that we feed into the model our data point and a set of uh, the labeling functions noisy votes on this data point. And so intuitively what we want the algorithm to do is to figure out how to combine these noisy votes in the best way. So in particular, we want the algorithm to learn the best uh, weighted combination of them where the weights are basically our model parameters theta. So the standard weak supervision algorithm has two steps, which is parameter learning and inference. So the first step is to learn the relationship between the true labels and uh, the true label and the votes. And uh, to do this, we are looking at the joint distribution over the Y and the lambdas. And we model this as a probabilistic graphical model that matches the structure on the right-hand side. It's a very simple structure. And um, so in this setting, uh, the model par parameters that I've been mentioning, the theta, they can actually be expressed quite intuitively. They are basically the average um, rate of agreement between the labeling function output and the true label. And so um, you can kind of see this uh, theta as a notion of the accuracy of the labeling function. And so we, we're gonna refer to them as accuracy parameters from here on out. And um, so the first step here is to learn these accuracy parameters. And um, the exact procedure can really depend. And there's been a lot of work, um, a lot of uh, algorithmic work focusing on this. Um, and so one approach is to do this like latent variable estimation. And uh, basically we compute the covariance matrix between the labeling functions, which are all observable, and we exploit some uh, structure in this matrix to recover the relationship between each labeling function and Y. Uh, 
And another one is to just simply do maximum likelihood estimation. So there are a lot of approaches, happy to talk about them more. And so once we've learned these accuracy parameters, we're mostly done. Um, we just need to write out this formula for how to take the data input and list of votes and convert that into a probabilistic label. And so it's uh, pretty uh, simple to do this inference in the most straightforward case. Um, you just want to apply Bayes' rule to estimate this conditional probability that we want. And what ends up happening is you just multiply out some simple linear transformations on these uh, accuracy parameters to get your probability. Um, but this approach is not perfect. And um, here I'm gonna tie back in the two challenges, um, the coarse grained accuracies and the abstains that I mentioned earlier. And so first note that this uh, probability here is um, does not depend on X. So basically, our model right now is throwing away any potential context we could get from the data point itself. And we're only relying on the information in the labeling uh, function outputs. And this is further reflected by how basically there are only M parameters of our model, which is one per labeling function to learn over the data set. And so this is kind of a more technical explanation of what I mean by these uh, coarse um, imprecise accuracies. And then uh, second, with this graphical model setup, it actually follows that when a labeling function abstains on a point x, so when this lambda i equals zero on x, um, the algorithm will just discard the discard this labeling function's information away. And we end up just computing the conditional probability on all of the other labeling functions votes. And so you can imagine in a very extreme case where all labeling functions vote zero, we basically are not conditioning on any signal from the labeling functions. And we just end up predicting the prior on the probability of y being equal to one. And that's not good because it's uh, pretty uninformative. So um, now let's talk about how foundation models can improve on these two points via our method Liger. So there are two simple modifications. The first modification to the weak supervision approach is to partition the input data in the embedding space and estimate a different set of parameters over each part. And so this will give us finer grained accuracy parameters. So you know, if we partition into three subsets of data, we'll now have three times M parameters to describe our model. And this will also bring us closer to approximating an output probability that actually takes into account the input data. So here, a probability that is conditional on X. Um, so remember, this was our data set from before with the three labeling functions applied to it. Um, and here, I'm now referring to this data set mapped into the embedding space of the foundation model. So our, what our method do is does is uh, it partitions this embedding space, uh, for instance, just this red line here, just for illustration. And um, in these embedding spaces, there might be a natural sort of division in the space between, for example, spam comments on music videos done by female artists versus spam comments on music videos done by male artists. Um, this is just an example. Um, and then we learn a set of parameters on each of these subgroups. And the hope here is that these parameters will be able to better capture the variation in data. So the second thing Liger does is that it improves coverage of the labeling functions by extending them in embedding space, basically in a k-nearest neighbors fashion. So uh, points that don't have a vote but are close to another point that have a vote will just get propagated that vote. And this will help reduce the number of abstains and allow for more signal on these points. So just to visualize this, we have our unlabeled data set before. And um, we're gonna do a transformation of each labeling function into an extended labeling function by propagating the votes. And so we do this one by one. And so when we put everything together, our extended labeling functions cover the entire data set or cover relatively more of the data set. And um, remember I, I identified this data point previously um, that had no votes on it at all, but uh, now it has a signal from, I believe, Two of the labeling functions and so we will be able to make a more informed uh, 
probabilistic output on this sample. So putting everything together, our method basically uses these extended labeling functions, which I'm referring to in the bottom as these uh, lambda bar here. Um, and we learn a model over these lambda bars by using a partition data set. And so that's um, pretty simple. That's just what um, our method is. So the next big question is, uh, why should we really expect this to do any good at all? And um, I'll briefly touch on what makes our method work uh, theoretically. So Liger basically relies on this local property of the foundation model embeddings, this notion of smoothness or ellipsedness of the labels in embedding space. So um, suppose this diagram below is just our embedding space. And um, let's look at a particular points embedding. Um, this is some, some uh, YouTube comment embedded in some, uh, let's say, uh, I don't know, GPT these embeddings. Um, and let's say it's not a spam comment. And let's look at points within a certain radius of this original point X. And so for very smooth embeddings, we'll see that points within a radius, a given radius, radius of X, will have the same label as X with a high probability. So this point X prime here will also not be spam because it's pretty close to X. But on the other hand, of course, if we move, as we move farther and farther away from X, we'll have less of a guarantee on knowing what the uh, label of farther away points are. So this orange point here will not be as certain if it's uh, not spam or spam. Um, but yeah, what in, in general, what I'm describing here is the smoothness of the true label in the foundation model embedding space. And um, yeah, so smoothness here basically refers to how unlikely the label will change as you move farther and farther away from a point. And this, uh, this all makes uh, natural sense when we put it in the context of our method. So if we have a very smooth embedding space, you can imagine that when we estimate parameters over this small yellow region, that the data distribution within this region is uh, like nice in some way and it's not changing significantly. And so we won't see anything crazy with um, how the spam to not spam distribution is changing in this local region. And so we can estimate these finer grained accuracy parameters pretty well. And um, for the on the abstain side, if we're just extending the labeling function within this small yellow circle, and the uh, labels aren't changing that much in the region, then we would expect that extending a labeling function vote will uh, be correct. Because, uh, or so given that a labeling function is already correct on, a, on this X, then if we extend that exact same vote to a nearby point, if the Y label doesn't change, then our labeling function is still correct. And so then this extension will provide us with good signal to work with. Um, but on the other hand, there are things to be careful of here. So if we go to extreme with our partitioning or extending in our method. So imagine if we partition into many sets, this uh, yellow circle I described becomes very small. And so we'll end up with very, very precise estimates of the conditional distribution that we want to output, but we won't have many points to learn over. And so our parameters will have high variance and um, if we extend our labeling functions very far in embedding space, it becomes more and more likely that the true label Y will flip as you move farther out. And so your extended labeling function vote is going to be less reliable as you move farther out. And so for these farther out points, um, it's often better to just have no signal from that labeling function than uh, an incorrect signal from that labeling function. So um, it's very important to control these two hyperparameters. So like how much you want to partition and how much you want to extend. And um, you want to control these depending on how good your embedding space is. And so the theoretical results in our recent paper, um, we characterize these generalization error bounds showing how much improvement over the standard weak supervision approach we get. And this depends on you know, the smoothness uh, how much data we have and the choice of the two hyperparameters I've discussed. Um, so I, I put in a little bit of theoretical results that we can go over quickly. Um, so for the first result, we're just kind of looking at 
how our method performs when we don't extend labeling functions. So this is just a general um, error bound for our method. And the interesting thing here is, so we have um, S sets of partitions and each set has an average diameter of D and uh, K is some smoothness constant. And our result is that we have this bias variance trade-off um, between the number of partitions. So when we look at this bias term and this variance term, if we increase the number of partitions, so if we increase S, this variance term will get higher. But um, as we continue to partition the data, the diameter of these sets becomes smaller, so our bias goes down. On the other hand, if we only had um, one set, so we're not partitioning at all, the variance will be lower because S is equal to one, but our bias will be bigger because this diameter is across the entire embedding space. And lastly, on the right, there is also a term here, this irreducible error, um, which is basically, you can see it as this conditional entropy, which is the amount of randomness in Y after we observe the data point and the votes on it. So now, so that was just talking about what the method does and what, how the partitions have a trade-off. So now we want to know what does actually extending and using these lambda bars do. So um, intuitively, it increases bias because uh, when we extend these labeling functions, we increase the diameter of these sets, and um, we also decrease in uh, we decrease variance because uh, we improve the coverage of these labeling functions, and so we have more points to estimate on. And so the actual interesting quantity here when we do this extension is how the irreducible error changes. So how much um, uncertainty is knowledge of lambda bar uh, reducing in Y versus regular lambda? And so that brings us to our second result, which is a, a bound on the improvement in irreducible error from using our extended labeling functions versus our not extended labeling functions. Um, and this is a bit of notation, I guess, but uh, the main things you need to know are that this improvement from using labeling functions depends critically on how much we extend. And so this extension depends on two quantities here, which is, or it impacts two quantities here, which is this P of I, which is um, how much, uh, what proportion of your data are you covering when you extend your labeling function? And then this M of R quantity is how smooth your labeling function, or how smooth your data is in the embedding space. So as you increase this uh, radius by which you're extending, this M of R becomes bigger. And so this uh, quantity on the right here goes smaller. But on the other hand, as you increase R, this uh, quantity in the front, this P of I will increase. So again, we have this very interesting trade-off that was I intuitively discussed before, where um, the choice of how much we extend is very important. And two other interesting things are, um, we basically will have guaranteed improvement over the non-extended labeling functions as long as our extended labeling function does better than random on average. And um, this middle term here, I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but what it means is that the improvement is going to be less when the other labeling functions are already very accurate. So now for our empirical results, we find that Liger, although very simple, outperforms weak supervision alone and those simple sequential combinations of weak supervision and foundation models that I mentioned before. So in our experiments, we look at a handful of video and text weak supervision data sets. And uh, for the text, we use GPT-3 embeddings and for video, we use clip embeddings. Um, and so the Liger column here is highlighted where we uh, we have done a hyperparameter search over the number of partitions and how we want, how much we want to extend each labeling function. And uh, you can see here that we outperform this uh, weak supervision LM, which is standard weak supervision, um, as well as these two other alternatives where we produce a weekly labeled data set and do something simple on it with like KNN or adapters on that data set. Next, we also want to confirm our theoretical observation that the smoothness of the foundation model embeddings are critical for the performance of our method. So for one of the video data sets, we tried our method using some different embeddings. 
And we see that the smoothest embeddings are the clip embeddings, because um, that's the lowest line on the graph here. And these also do perform the best. Um, on the other hand, the raw pixel space, ResNet, and BIT are not as smooth and have worse performance. And we can also see this on the text data sets. So for one of the data sets, Spouse, the, um, for brief background on Spouse, it's a question data set where you're trying to identify if the, the two people in the sentence our spouses. Um, so we played around with how to embed these uh, sentences and tried three different ways of prompting. So we would put um, this uh, additional text, our person X and person Y spouses. And we put this prompt at the beginning, at the end, or didn't use the prompt. And here again, we find that the smoothness of the embeddings is correlated with the model performance. So um, when we put the prompt at the end, our embeddings were smooth, and this happened to also do the best. So this matches kind of our theory. And so we've uh, reached the end of this talk. So to summarize, in machine learning, one of the biggest goals is to make deploying models um, more practical and accessible to everyone. And there have been big advances in both directions of uh, the data and the models and uh, working with these unlabeled data sets and large pre-trained models. And so uh, basically, there's been a lot of work on uh, broadly ways to use these alternative forms of knowledge that are lying around rather than uh, hand labeling and training from scratch. And so our method, LIGER, provides a simple way of combining weak supervision with a signal in foundation models. And it's just two simple steps that exploit the smoothness of label distributions in embedding space. So in particular, we partition the data set for richer parameterization and we extend our labeling functions to improve coverage. And we find that this method outperforms standard weak supervision and simple baselines that combine the two concepts. And we empirically confirm that performance is correlated with the smoothness property. And uh, last, lastly, I'd like to point out a general exciting future direction. So basically, one way we can kind of see these foundation models is as these uh, black box sources of information that are just um, available to us, and they are easy to use for practitioners to just um, apply to their code, but uh, maybe we don't have complete access to this model. We don't have access to all the, all the billions or trillions of parameters, but I hope that this um, changing way we interface with these large models can um, inspire new methods and tools for analyzing them. Um, and uh, for how to best utilize these uh, foundation model signals in very uh, cheap and efficient ways. And for example, uh, because we often only have access to the embeddings, or it's just simpler to work with those, um, an interesting direction would be to think more about how to train and get uh, meaningful results on just those embeddings, such as using adapters or training these, you know, lightweight, smaller models using just these embeddings. And um, then since there are more and more of these pre-trained models that are just um, widely available and you can just import, it becomes more important for us to figure out um, which one we want to use. So a thing I've been wondering is um, if you can choose a good foundation model or good pre-trained model in a very principled way, maybe even by like doing some sort of you know, online algorithm for measuring the smoothness or evaluating it quickly. And uh, lastly, as a more, even more out there idea, I'm interested in if there's a way to smartly combine multiple pre-trained models together and uh, potentially even with some sort of weak supervision concept here. Um, Cause sometimes, you know, these different uh, representations will have different sorts of information encoded in them. And so, you know, we want to get, extract as much information as possible from all of them. Um, and so, yeah, that's the end of my talk. So my contact information is above, along with my um, first co-author Dan's contact information. And uh, here's the title of our recent work and our link to the paper. Um, again, I'd like to thank everyone for having me, and I'll take any questions now. Yeah, this was very exciting. Um, we had some uh, questions on the Q&A. Uh, mm -hmm. that Fred was kind enough to answer, but I, I don't know if you'd like to expand on any of them. Sure. I can read the first question. So it says, is Liger, is Liger built on top of epoxy? Was, what's its differences with epoxy? Yeah, so um, 
Yeah, Liger is basically our kind of like a little follow up to epoxy. So the main idea of epoxy was to focus on those um, extensions to fix the problem of abstain, abstaining labeling functions. And then in Liger, we additionally realized there were other opportunities to exploit the foundation model embedding space. So we have that um, finer grained accuracy modeling in Liger, where you know we partition the data set and fit separate um, separate sets of parameters. And this allows us to uh, relax the model constraints and get uh, better estimates too. Nice, nice. So we have a next one. It says, can weak supervision problems be solved with boosting? What makes it harder, more interesting? Is it that we want to incorporate embeddings from a foundation model? Yeah, so I guess with boosting, technically you, it's a setting where we do have uh, labeled data known, I, if I'm correct. And uh, in weak supervision, we assume there is uh, no, no labeled data at all. And so um, the, the, the spirit of the method is similar, right? We're just combining these things, but how we learn to combine them is uh, by looking only at these observable sources of information um, through the uh, labeling functions. So I hope that answers the question. Awesome. Uh, the next one uh, says, why should we expect embeddings to be smooth since they are outputs from neural networks? Yeah, so I guess if you look at, um, if you think about, you know, just like the embedding space, it, yeah, neural networks are not very smooth in that sense. Um, but we're talking about smoothness in terms of the uh, labels. So saying that our, if we kind of just, uh, like color and look at this embedding space and you know, color in which points are spam or not, you'd expect that um, your spam and not spam are not going to be just like randomly distributed in this embedding space. There has, there should be some sort of signal. Um, and this is kind of just like a notion of um, more broadly, it's called like input consistency, which is a assumption that's been kind of used in, you know, these like self-supervised or unsupervised algorithms is that, uh, if you have a point with label Y, uh, points nearby it with high uh, probability will also have the same label. That's great. And um, th the last one says, have you tested using embeddings of pre-trained transformers like BERT or others? And do they fall short uh, in comparison to FF models? In comparison to what models? FM models. Um, foundation models. Yes. Foundation yeah. So we did in the original version of this, like, so this is a follow up to epoxy. We used, um, we used BERT embeddings, um, but that was BERT from uh, 2020. So we haven't, I do, I don't think we've done it, done these with BERT embeddings. Um, we just wanted to try using like, you know, the newest, yeah, the GPT-3 embeddings, but yeah, that would be something fun to explore. Just more of these, uh, more of these things, just apply them quickly. Wonderful. So Mayi, um, I think that concludes our Q&A. Uh, thank mm -hmm. you so much for joining us. And uh, yeah. thank you everyone for joining. Um, uh, we genuinely hope that you enjoyed this talk about dramatically improving weak supervision techniques with Liger. Uh, we'll be working on posting the video to YouTube. Uh, in the meantime, please stay tuned by following us on social or subscribing uh, to YouTube at Snorkel AI. And please do follow Mayi at Mayi Chen on Twitter. Yeah, thank you guys for coming. Uh, sorry about the Zoom technical difficulties. So, no worries, Maggie. You're awesome. Thank you. Thank you.